I found a link buried on an old dark web forum. I wish I never clicked it. Posted by Born Beach. The dark web. The name itself is a meme. It's become the boomer boogeyman, the back alley of the internet where you go to get your kidneys harvested and sold off to a billionaire's all-you-can-torture buffet. It's the skeezy part of town, the no-man's land of the digital world, chock full of society's most vile scum. It's also pretty boring. See, the dark web really isn't that much different than the surface web. Sure, it has a cooler name and better privacy, but most people use it for the same shit. Social media? Check. Shopping? Check. Pirating movies? Duh. Did you know Facebook exists on the dark web? You do now. My parents are terrified of the dark web. They speak about hushed breaths, sort of like Ron Weasley talks about Lord Voldemort. It's as though they think uttering its name too loudly will invoke the wrath of some serial hacker just waiting in the wings to delete their bank accounts. Ridiculous, right? I told them they were paranoid. To prove them wrong, I even downloaded the Tor browser and uninstalled Chrome. There's nothing to fear on the dark web, I said, so long as you've got half a brain's worth of sense in you. Now I wish I could take it all back. I stumbled across the website after a long night of drinking. I'd been out with Jared, my best friend since childhood, reminiscing about the good old days of driving Mrs. Crabtree up the wall. When I got home, I felt a bit nostalgic, so I went digging for old pictures on Facebook. Like most drunk missions, one thing led to another, and I landed on an old thread listing the most exciting websites on the dark web. WAPS Most were fairly vanilla. Some free textbooks here, a bit of hacked video games there. I scrolled down through the responses until I found one buried beneath the others. It had just a single upvote. I stared at the link for a few seconds, then cracked a fresh beer and said fuck it. The website was plain, mostly white text on a black background. Across the top was a banner emblazoned with the words call your monsters. I cracked a grin. It was kind of cute, in an edgelord, emo kid sort of way. After clicking through a few menu links, I landed on the order a monster page. It said that, for $99, they would deliver a personalized monster to a doorstep of my choice. Free shipping, too. The flavor text read. Perfect for getting even with terrible bosses, backstabbing friends, and childhood enemies. I laughed. The idea was absolute gold. They even had a monster call guarantee of same-day shipping. How they managed to pull that off, I had no idea. Maybe they had a network of paid actors, patiently waiting to dress up in Halloween costumes and say a few can lines on somebody's doorstep. Or maybe it was like Build-A-Bear, where you got to design your own stuffed version of ghouls like Dracula and the Wolfman. Whatever it was, I decided I was far too drunk to give a shit about how they made it happen. All I knew was a hundred bucks was a damn steal. I smashed the order button, and it brought me to a follow-up page titled Design Your Monster. I practically licked my lips. This was the juicy bit. The website gave me a drop-down list of selectable options based on modifiable body parts. The mouth, for instance, had fangs, broken teeth, an O mouth, multiple mouths, and too many teeth. I thought the idea of too many teeth sounded ridiculous enough to be awesome, so I picked that and went down the list and selected the rest of the monster's attributes, including its body type, its subspecies, and finally its power. The next page said leave a message. I mulled it over for a few minutes before deciding to keep it simple. I typed boo into the text field. Once I was finished, I clicked complete and it brought me to a new screen that made me jump. It was a webcam video of me, staring shocked at my laptop. The stream was live. At the top of the page, a red text banner proclaimed perform the blood sacrifice. I cocked an eyebrow. What? As if in answer to my confusion, 
A list of instructions faded into view on the bottom of the screen. Utter the name of your recipient. Pierce your skin. Consume your blood. I burst out laughing. This was too wild. Not only were they gonna deliver up a monster to somebody's doorstep, but they were gonna include a goofy ritual video too. All right, I decided, I'm game. I went downstairs and grabbed a knife from the kitchen drawer and headed back up to my room. Holding my hand up with a coy grin, I pricked my thumb with the tip of the blade. Jared Mayhew. I announced it dramatically. I stuffed my bleeding thumb into my mouth and sucked it clean. Then I held it up, drunk and proud, as evidence of my dark ritual complete. Seconds passed and nothing happened. Then, the screen went black and a new page appeared. Order complete. Delivery in progress. I sipped my beer, wondering how Jared would react to my spooky surprise landing on his doorstep tomorrow. I really hoped they included the blood sacrifice bit. Jared and his wife, Alyssa, both hated blood, so they'd never let me live it down, and that was exactly what I wanted. A couple of seconds later, a new screen popped up. Delivery complete. Stand by for results. Already? That didn't make any sense. How did they manage to create my order and ship it across the country, all in the span of five minutes? A depressing realization swept over me. My drunk ass had been duped. There was no way they'd be able to ship something that quickly. So the only explanation was, A, it was a scam, or B, it was just some lame email jump scare. Fuck. Now the $99 made more sense. There was no way a tiny startup could offer same-day delivery and a compelling product for so little money. It was a pipe dream logistically. Defeated, I decided that was enough dark web shopping for one night and time to pack it in. I closed my laptop, brushed my teeth, and hopped into bed. My phone vibrated. I stared at it, wondering who would be messaging me at this hour. Jared, maybe? He was just as drunk as I was and probably high as a kite by now too. I picked it up and saw one new email from Monster Call. Odd. I never gave them my email address. Order delivered. Click here to view results. View results? I heaved a sigh. This was either a virus or some guarantee that Jared got a corny, spooky email. Still drunk, still making poor decisions, I clicked the link and it opened a video feed. Of Jared's house. I sat up, my tiredness vanishing in a tidal wave of what the fuck. The video was dimly lit, and the way it bobbed up and down looked like it was being recorded off of somebody's cell phone. Jared's small, two-bedroom home was there in all of its suburban glory. Something about the video felt off, though. Wrong. I told myself to relax. This was just some prank or gag. The company probably put out a call for a fraction of the money to any locals, and somebody pulled the contract. No doubt they were going to walk up the front steps, knock on his door, and then say boo and run off or some shit. It wasn't a big deal. So why was my heart racing? The video neared the house, the footsteps going slowly. In the silence of the night, I heard the person behind the camera breathing. They sounded frightened, scared. Why? Lights went on inside the house, painting the windows in a dull yellow glow. I squinted, seeing dark shapes darting behind the curtains. Thoroughly confused, I decided to message Jared and ask if he got my surprise. Terrence, sup dude, you get my special delivery? Jared, help. Jared, something. Jared, inside the house. Dark splotches splattered against the curtains. A moment later, a woman's scream rang out and the window shattered. Two hands reached out from behind the billowing curtains, gripping the side of the windowsill. Then two more gripped the top, 
a figure emerged, lurching out of the opening and into the yard. It looked familiar. Jesus Christ, it looked familiar. It stood eight feet tall, with large bat wings flared out behind it and four crooked, muscular arms clenching in and out of fists. The person behind the camera stumbled backward, muttering something incoherent. The creature swiveled its head toward them. The video feed shifted. Images of the sidewalk flew up and down as the cameraman ran full tilt from Jared's house, heaving panicked gasps. I caught muffled fragments of prayers. Then a shriek sounded, followed by the flap of powerful wings. The video crashed, tumbling in a blur of pixels. A man's voice shouted for help, and then something heavy crunched, and his voice died with a wheeze. Another shriek filled the night, and a shadow appeared, gazing down toward the discarded cell phone. It had four arms, a pair of wings, and a mouth filled with rows and rows of teeth. Too many teeth. I lurched forward, swallowing the vomit in my throat. In one of the creature's arms was a 30-something man, struggling wordlessly against the monster's might. His chest looked like it had been caved in. The creature leaned towards him, pressed its teeth against his face, and slowly bit down. The man's legs kicked and jolted as the beast's teeth began rotating like a blender, tearing his flesh from his skull. It dropped him there, convulsing and dying, then beat its great wings and took off into the sky. Moments later, I heard confused shouts. Footsteps pounded against the pavement. More hollers. People called for the police. Other neighbors told children to get back inside. I put my phone down, horrified. It had to have been a joke. There simply was no way that had actually happened. It couldn't have. It was too gruesome and too violent. That was digital effects all the way. It had to be. They were great those days. Weren't they? The next day, I got a call from Jared's parents. His mother tried to talk, but she couldn't get past the tears, so she put Jared's father on the line. He explained that something terrible happened last night. My heart slammed in my chest. W what happened? I asked. I told myself to relax, that there was nothing to worry about. Monsters didn't exist. I knew that. Terence, he said quietly. This isn't easy to talk about, and it's harder to hear, but last night somebody broke into Jared and Alyssa's home. Police think it was sometime around two in the morning. My jaw hung limp, my hand trembling as I held the phone to my ear. A terrible coincidence. That's all it was. A terrible, horrible coincidence. I don't know how to say this, he said, so I'm just going to come right out with it. He took a deep, shuddering breath, and when he spoke again his voice was as fragile as glass. The intruder that broke in? He mutilated them. Mutilated? I said in a small voice. Oh my God. Jesus. Yes. I'm sorry to tell you all this, but you were his well, you were best friends, and I think it's better that you hear this from me than the newspaper. He paused, as though summoning the courage to say the next words. According to the police, the psychopath that broke and gnawed their faces off. Vomit rose in my stomach. I forced it down. Oh Christ, I'm sorry. I'm so, so sorry. I ran a hand through my hair, gripping it forcefully and pulling on it, praying the pain would wake me from this nightmare. Please, Roger, let me handle the funeral preparations. You and Charlene should take this time to grieve. That's the thing, Roger said, his voice trembling with emotion. There won't be a funeral. What? They're still alive, Terence. That son of a bitch left them broken and bleeding, to live with the torture he'd inflicted on them. He choked back a sob before recomposing himself. So far, there's no trace of the bastard. 
The only lead the cops have is a crumpled note they found on the doorstep. He left a note? Yeah, but it was just one word. Practically useless. I swallowed. What did it say? Boo. I played a text-based adventure game on the dark web. I can't undo the things I did. Posted by Wendy Go Roar. I spend a lot of time on Reddit. I'm sure you do too. I'm on a lot of video game subs and in particular ones about text-based games. I'm talking about games like Zork. I wasn't alive when Zork came out, but I got really into it in high school. When I made it to college, I took an even deeper dive, playing all the sequels, all the knockoffs, and every shitty game that people had cobbled together and released online. I had to refocus a bit, adding work on top of college courses so I could afford my shoebox apartment, but eventually I came across a post called Apartment Complex. Not a super promising name, but I was bored and it was free and the fact that it was hosted on some weird site that I couldn't access from regular browsers appealed to me. It added an element of mystery. So I opened a Tor browser, entered the link, and got to a profile creation page. Basic stuff, username, preferred resolution, etc. It didn't ask for any personal info, so I kept going. The screen went blank, then a text box opened up. Welcome to the apartment complex. You have been assigned your very own apartment building to run. But this isn't any apartment building because the tenants are going to be experiencing some pretty scary ordeals. You get to decide what happens next. Will your tenants survive? Will you accidentally butcher them all? The power is in your hands. Are you ready? Yes or no? Why not? I figured. I typed in a Y. More text appeared. Excellent. We'll start you off with an easy management level. You have six tenants, numbered one to six. None of them know each other well. Enter a number to learn more about a tenant and begin to make decisions. I grabbed a six-sided die off my desk and rolled it. Three. Three. I typed. Intriguing choice. The tenant in apartment three is Sherry. She's 19 and a sophomore in college. All her friends know her to be outgoing and flirty, and she brings new guys back to her apartment multiple times a week. She doesn't want a commitment. She enjoys sex, but mostly she just likes not being alone. It's possible it's related to how she was repeatedly abandoned by foster parents. Tonight, she brought home a young man named Thad. She plans to have sex with Thad and he will pressure her not to use a condom. She will say yes because she doesn't want to scare him off, but you can help her out. Should tonight be the night she stands up to Thad and tells him she won't sleep with him without protection at the risk of spending the night alone? Yes or no? I didn't realize this game would be so. Domestic soap opera? Whatever, I thought. Let's see how this plays out. E -tight. Intriguing choice. Thad and Sherry start to get hot and heavy. When they are naked on her couch, Thad starts to try penetrating her, but Sherry stops him and says he needs to use a condom. Thad complains that it doesn't feel as good. Sherry tells him that it's more important that both of them are protected from STDs. She's feeling a little tense. Thad calls her a whore and a tease and throws his clothes back on. Sherry cries as Thad goes to storm out. Unfortunately, Sherry's door won't open. Thad checks, and the door isn't locked, but it refuses to open. Furious, Thad storms back to where Sherry is still laying naked on the couch, crying, and begins to scream at her. Would you like to continue making decisions for Sherry, or try another tenant? One, for Sherry, two, for the new tenant. This game was weird and pretty retro, but I also found myself pretty intrigued by Sherry and Thad's story. The clunky stories in these games had a certain charm that made them very engaging. Fuck it, let's keep going. One, I typed. 
Intriguing choice. Thad continues to scream at Sherry, who can't stop crying. She's afraid he might hit her. Thad hasn't decided if he will or not, but plans to let his anger and lack of concern for Sherry as a human being guide his behavior. If things continue as they are, Thad will most likely beat Sherry to the point she will need to be rushed to the emergency room. Should that be stopped? Yes or no? Fuck. I mumbled out loud to myself. This got intense. E -e -tight. Intriguing choice. A ceiling tile falls off. The edge cuts across Thad's jugular. Blood gushes everywhere. He is dead in seconds. What the fuck? I said to myself. This game is whack. The text continued to appear. Sherry is horrified. Much of the blood sprayed all over her. She's so scared. She starts to shut down. Sherry won't be taking any more actions for a while. Choose a tenant. One, two, four, five, six inch. Damn. I thought. Looks like I'm not going to finish this game with a decent score. Keep plugging away though. I rolled the die again. Five. I typed it in. Intriguing choice. The tenant in apartment five is Clyde. He is 35 and works at the local First State Bank. His hobbies include snowboarding, tennis, recreational murder, 90s sitcoms, and fishing. He's home alone tonight after his girlfriend, Alicia, texted him and told him she was leaving him for his brother. He bought a gallon of chocolate chip cookie dough ice cream and is working his way through that and the third season of Frasier. He feels the itch to strangle someone. It's been a while, and he's trying to kick the habit, but the deep well of emotion seems to be so deep that ice cream alone can't fill it. He's hoping to quench the urge with a TV binge, but just as he's settling in, he starts to smell gas. Should he investigate? Not investigating would be boring, so of course I typed in a Y. Intriguing choice. Clyde gets off the couch and follows his nose to the kitchen, where a heavy propane smell is blasting out of one of the burners. He's familiar enough with gas, leaks to know that he's one spark away from Clyde Flambe. Should Clyde leave, or keep sucking up the fumes? One, Clyde leaves, or two, Clyde stays. Seems weird to release the murderer, I thought, but it would be boring to just gas him to death. I type a one. Intriguing choice. Clyde exits his apartment and heads down the stairs to the front door. When he makes it to the floor below his, he sees that the stairs are blocked by fallen ceiling tiles. There are stairs on the opposite side of the floor. On the way, he would pass two other apartments, which would likely have phones to call the fire department to handle the gas leak. Should he stop at the first apartment? One, the second apartment, two, or take the stairs, three inch. One, I typed. Intriguing choice. That was it. No more text. What the hell? I said under my breath. And then there was a knock on my door. I froze. Hey, is anyone home? A voice called from the other side of my door. My name's Clyde. I live on the floor above you. My phone isn't working and my apartment smells like gas. Can I borrow your phone? I sat as still as I could, making no sound. Seriously, it's an emergency. I'm pretty sure I heard some noise in there. I need help. On my screen, I saw more text pop up. Should Clyde keep trying the first apartment? One, try the next apartment, two, or take the stairs on the far end of the floor, three. As gently as I could, I pressed two. The clack of the key sounded like a gunshot in my head. Whatever, asshole. I know you're home. I hope you enjoy being a piece of shit, Clyde said. Then I heard his footsteps go down the hall. The apartment building I'm in is new and pretty well insulated, but I could faintly hear knocking on the apartment down the hall from me. I knew a college girl lived there. Hopefully she isn't home. Wait. 
college girl? No, it couldn't be. Text started filling up my screen again. Clyde went to the next apartment and knocked on the door. He heard sobbing from inside. When the tenant inside didn't open the door, he tried the knob. It turned, but the door wouldn't budge. It looked like it was misaligned, and with the heat wave, the wood had swollen and jammed the door in place. Suddenly, I heard a smash from outside. I tore my eyes to look at my front door, but it was still solidly shut. The sound had come from down the hall. I looked back at my screen. Clyde used his shoulder to slam the door and it popped open. He stepped in, calling to whoever was in the apartment. Walking further in, he saw a shocking sight, a man on the ground, his neck slashed open, a ceiling tile on the ground next to him, on the couch, a completely naked young woman, and covering everything, a massive splatter of blood. Clyde grinned. Are you going to help Sherry leave your apartment and go to hers, or do nothing while Clyde murders her? One. This was so messed up. I couldn't just let someone murder my neighbor, even if I barely knew her. But I was terrified. I got up, ran to my kitchen, grabbed the biggest knife I could find, then went to my door. I took three deep breaths to steady myself then I unlocked the door, threw it open, and ran out into the hall. I looked over to where the other apartment was, and I could see where the door had been broken in. I ran as quietly as I could over there, and when I reached the door, stopped short and stuck my head around the door frame to see what was going on. Unfortunately, I couldn't see what was happening from where I was. I crept in as stealthily as I could. The first thing that hit me was the bitter stench of blood. Then I got close enough to see what was happening. Sherry was on her back on the couch, Clyde leaning over her with his hands around her throat. She was scratching at him, but the blood made everything slick and it looked like her nails were sliding around more than doing damage. I ran up to them and drove my knife straight into Clyde's back. He roared and whirled around. You bastard, he yelled and dove at me, tackling me to the ground. He started pummeling me with his fists. There was little I could do to stop him. With each blow, I felt myself getting weaker, my vision going darker. And then Clyde screamed. I focused as best I could. Above Clyde, Sherry was raising the knife for another blow. She stabbed Clyde over and over until he collapsed on top of me, and then she stabbed him some more. I screamed at her to stop, to let me up, and eventually I broke through her terror. She helped me push his body off. I threw a blanket around Sherry and then called the cops. We spent a lot of time going over our stories with them. I left out the dark web stuff because I didn't want to get in trouble. Finally, the cops left. Sherry went to go stay with her parents, and I went back to my apartment. When I got back, words were flashing on my screen. Remember, everything that happened tonight was your choice. And below that, we hope you play at the apartment complex again. Creeper in the webcam. Posted by Anonymous. Being an author on the internet is not the easiest thing to do. I write stories that are fiction and people read or listen to them. I would say that maybe 50,000 people listen per month, maybe more. It's a lot of work, but I really enjoy writing horror stories. Okay, I did enjoy writing horror stories until this little creeper came along. This guy creeps on everyone. He has every social media known for all things dark. He enjoys harassing women content creators and does it often. Does he do it on purpose? Yes, I'm sure he does. He has been reported so many times and lost accounts on various services and complains about it every time. Because of him, I've added several outside web security cams around my house. At first, they worked well and maybe a little too well. 
It grew quite annoying seeing messages pop up about the wildlife in the area or trees blowing in the wind, so I turned the motion sensor down a notch. It works a lot better now, except there is one big problem, ghosting. I'm not sure if you know what ghosting is, but when you see weird shapes that might look human but are hard to decipher because there is a lot of fog or static on the image or video. My cameras have recently been ghosting late at night. I thought it might be a bird or some other creature, but it looks like it walks on two legs and is in human form. Most of my video footage is written over by the next day, so I didn't get too many images of this thing. I did send a couple to the local police, but they simply told me it wasn't a human and I shouldn't worry about it. Then the other night, I saw a face in one of these images. I lost my breakfast. The face was of a 20-something-year-old man. It was definitely a face and a body. I couldn't quite see the body, though. It was all fuzzy. The face was actually there on top of this body. I showed that to the police and they opened a trespassing file but didn't do anything about it. Oh boy, thank you. I've started to get really weird emails now with what look like threats. The URLs are really weird and will not open on a regular browser. I have to open them in TOR, which means I have to go into the dark web to find them. The images are usually very threatening and as of recently, they have started looking like me and that face in the camera that night. Then the other night, I was sent a dark web picture of the same images I was seeing on the camera. The exact same images. So this guy has somehow hacked into my security system. He also has it set to some sort of weird web page that has a countdown to it and a chat room. People keep visiting the chat room and making Bitcoin bids. The countdown ends tonight a minute before midnight. I'm thinking about heading out of town, but I have to bring my animals. I also received a message from the creeper I talked about earlier. The message said, see you soon. No one can find him. The feds and the cops are clueless as to who he is. I don't know what to do. What would you do? I participated in a dark web treasure hunt. It was a stupid ass decision. Posted by Richard Saxon. For my birthday, I decided to treat myself to a dark web mystery box gift. It was a service I'd used several times before and they had never disappointed, sending heaps of useless but funny things to my doorstep. Happy birthday, Trevor. A note on the box read. I picked up the package placed on my doorstep and noticed a letter attached to it. There comes a time in every man's life where their skills and knowledge have to be tested. With that in mind, I shall set you out on a treasure hunt. Please follow the instructions within the box and for safety reasons, burn every letter once it has been read or solved. To my surprise, the note was signed by Pete, my best friend since childhood. It was a neat surprise, but I was confused as to how exactly he'd gotten involved with the anonymous service. Whether he was just an active user there himself who'd recognized me, or if he'd been contacted by the website, I didn't know. Nevertheless, it seemed like a cool gift. My first clue would simply be a piece of paper with two incoherent words written on it. Could it be a name? Maybe a location? I sat down with it and contemplated the words in front of me. After just a minute, I realized it was an anagram. The letters just had to be rearranged to form a new meaning. Man Cave was the hidden message. It was a reference to Pete's basement a place we'd frequently spent our Saturday nights, playing video games and drinking whiskey. I burned the letter in accordance with the instructions and quickly made my way to the man cave. There, I used my spare key to unlock the door, half expecting a surprise party. Instead, all I found was another clue. An ace of spades and a picture. Both were pinned to a board with an unfamiliar knife. I removed the knife and checked out the clues. 
The picture itself was of a place we frequently went with friends to smoke and relax, a beautiful field which no one knew about. It was just a short hike outside the city. I made my way there in about an hour. Our usual place was hidden in the shade beneath some trees. Once there, I noticed a shovel sticking out of the ground on top of some fresh dirt. Spade ace of spades. Very creative. I chuckled to myself. Without hesitation, I picked it up and started digging through the ground. After less than a minute, I hit something solid. Expecting another clue, I bent down and brushed away the dirt. As I put my hand on the cold surface, I immediately retracted it in shock. It was Pete, buried under the dirt, dead from multiple stab wounds to his chest. In shock, I called the police, devastated by the loss of my best friend. While I waited, I sat down and tried to figure out what the hell had happened. That's when I realized that I had burned every note and that my fingerprints were all over the murder scene. From the strange knife in the basement to the key and the shovel itself used to bury him.